going to do a little housekeeping. If that's okay. I'm going to slide this up. Slide this out of the way. Dwayne, you can deal with this later. Something about standing way behind this big piece of wood. I feel so... Wow. Can we turn it down just a little bit? Yeah, thank you. I got a loud voice, so I might not even need this. But it's great to be here, church. Seriously. You know, I got with the, the family group leaders last night and the board of directors, and, and one of the things we talked about, so I'm, I'm violating what I've already told them about not talking about the meeting. But I share with them, you know, as Christians, we've got to learn to laugh more. We need to learn to enjoy our lives more. We are some of the most crusty people on the planet. I kid you not. We expect so much from one another and we get bad attitudes. And Think about it. Jesus died, rose from the dead, so you and I could be saved and go to heaven. That's how we should start every day. Period. And laugh more. I was sharing with some of the Marys. I said, you know, for me in, in Halifax, my wife and I, when it comes to Marys, there's, there's a few different things that we look at. One of them is, how is your banter with one another? Husband and wife, what's your banter like? How do you interact? And if there's no banter, I get concerned. If there's banter and it's edgy, I get concerned. But if you're just joking around all the time, to me, that's a sign of a healthy marriage. So I share with them one of the running jokes that Rita and I have. And we watch this episode of The Simpsons. And Bart Simpson rips off the head of his sister's doll. And she gets really mad. And she starts going, I'm going to start doing this. And if you get in the way, it's your own fault. And so then Bart's back here and he goes, okay, well, I'm going to start doing this. And if you get in the way, it's your own fault. And he, they collide. And, and so my wife and I, when we start joking around, we'll go, okay, fine. I'm going to start doing this. And if you get in the way. And so we wrestle around and play. It's healthy. It's healthy for us to laugh and enjoy what God has blessed us with. Amen? I am so grateful for being here. Uh, send greetings from Halifax. Church is doing great. Um, my wife says hello. She wasn't able to be here uh, this weekend, but uh, she sends her love. And again, can we turn this down a little more? I just got this big echo up here. Is that possible? Turn it down a little bit more. <laughs> when I got feedback on my own voice, I know I'm in trouble. Um, but anyway, she's doing great. Um, I wanted to share a couple highlights from last year of our church. We celebrated, the uh, Halifax celebrated their 20th anniversary uh, last year in August. And it was a great time. We had uh, brothers and sisters come in from all over. We actually had Ron and Cheryl Hammer come on in from California, uh, which was great to have them there. We had Sean and Robin Barnes, who lead a region in Queens, New York. They came on up for it. We had people from Toronto. We had a lot of people come. I believe the Martins, you guys even showed up, right? Part of your vacation. So Karen loved it because she went to school out there once upon a time. So, But we had a great time. It was a great service. I think at our service on the Sunday, we had about 180 people there. Uh, and so it was a lot of fun. Great time. Uh, Cameron Taylor, uh, the son of Greg and Nancy Taylor, he actually wrote a song for it entitled Drawn because that was a theme and it was an incredible song. The guy is so gifted. And uh, we keep wanting to redo it, but we need many pieces and parts to actually perform it. And so we don't have all the parts. So, but it's a great song. And uh, last year, we had four baptisms in our church and wish we had more, but we're grateful for the four that we had. And one of them was a, a young campus woman named Emily. And the first thing she came out to was the Christmas banquet uh, in, at the end of December. And she literally, this is what she said, I can't believe that these people are like this all the time. So she started coming to church to see for herself. Started coming, started studying the Bible, got baptized. Then brought her mom out, Sarah. She starts studying with my wife. And you knew this was of God when. My wife owns a 2012 Fiat. White, black, convertible roof. She goes to the study. Now when they come walking out, they're walking together to wherever they parked. And as they walk up, Sarah goes to get in her car, which is a black Fiat parked right behind my wife's. 
So you got a black fiat and a white fiat. They become great friends. She gets baptized and is doing awesome. And then I just got one of those messages as the church leader. Um, can you uh, recommend her for DT Heart and Soul? So Sarah's all fired up and connected now and fired up about that. But she's a great lady. And then uh, we've got a new ministry that's developing. It's called the Yo Pros, Young Professionals. And so it's led by my son Josh and his wife Kelsey and another couple, Megan and Manny. Life is different than when I was younger. My son at 23 graduates school and within two months lands a full-time job and gets married. Two years into his marriage, they just bought their first home. And I'm like, dude, it took me to 40 before I bought my first house. Like, what is going on? And then he's negotiated a couple salary increases, and, I, and then he told me about it, and I said, man, you're making as much, much money as I'm making. You've only been working for two years. Son, you need to put an in-law suite in your house. I need to move in. You start taking care of me. So, but uh, a lot of positive things going on there, and it's great. And great to be here in the church and, and seeing everybody. I really appreciate I uh, got picked up at the airport last night by Wayne, expecting to go to the hotel check-in and then go and get together with everybody. Uh, he said, well, my wife has prepared dinner for us. So I went over to her great cooking, big tray of lasagna, salad, bread. And the best part of it all was we were serving the food and her son had to sit there and wait patiently before we ate because she was preparing salad and stuff at the same time. And he, he was so gracious. He just sat there, polite, quiet, took his time. But one of the funniest things was we walk in and they have a family portrait. So I'm looking at it and the kids and all of a sudden the kids start coming out and Wayne starts introducing them going, hold on, that's that guy? <laughs> that's her, like it was just, that's when you start realizing how old you are, when you meet people's kids. So anyways, I could go on all day about stuff like that. We had a great time last night meeting with your leadership group and your board of directors. We had a great time talking. And uh, again, really appreciate all the encouragement and love. I've got a lesson today. If you turn with me over to Genesis chapter 11, old school, old time. You, if you have a Bible, please turn over there. If you have an electronic device, feel free to tick over to whatever app you need there and turn it on. But there's a lot of stuff we can learn from this in. Genesis 11 and verse 1. It says, Now the whole world had one language and common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. You know, what do we learn from this story? And it's an amazing story. And again, sometimes what we do is we take the negative side of stuff. But they all came together, spoke the same language, and began to build an incredible tower. What an incredible story of unity. Pulling together, working together. They built this tower, and why? Why? The problem was for their own namesake. Let us do this. Let us be glorified. When I was in Calgary, we used to call it the notice me factor. Hey, notice me. Notice what I'm doing? See what I did? Hey, I'm over here. That's what they were doing. And as they built this thing, which was awesome, part of the reason was they didn't want to be scattered all over. They decided they didn't want God's plan. They wanted their own. And so God came down. What does God say about them? He commends them on their unity. 
He says, man, as one person speaking the same language, if they could begin to do this, there's nothing that is impossible for them. So I need to divide them up by languages so they scatter to fulfill my command. What an incredible story. God gets involved because he sees what the power of a unified effort can do, that nothing is impossible. I played a lot of sports in my life. I've been on some good teams. I've been on a lot of bad teams. As my son was growing up, I tried to help him understand the concept that you're going to lose more games than you ever win. That's just the reality of playing sports. I've been on teams, though, that have had the best roster on paper and have failed miserably. And then I've been on teams that people look at you and go, you guys, you're going to win Jack and have won championships. And what is the difference? Unity. My son played high school football. We didn't have one recognized football player on a senior team. Other high schools had all these guys who were, people were looking at them, gonna, wanted to recruit them to universities and colleges, and they played in the summer on these other league teams. When it came to the playoffs, his team that I helped coach was being mocked on social media because we had no recognized athletes. It's interesting how the mockery stopped when they held up the Western Championship of the city because they played together. They understood their roles, they understood their job, and they just did their work, and they were friends. They had each other's back. That, to me, is what I hear here in the tower. These guys, everybody there, they were working together. I made this comment last night to the group. Anybody here, and I'm sure lots will, have seen Finding Nemo? Come on. Who's seen Finding Nemo? Okay, so do you remember the scene where all the fish are caught in the fisherman's net? And what does Nemo tell them? Swim down. And they're like, well, they're all going their own way. Swim down. And eventually, once they all get going the same way, they put pressure on that big piece of wood and it snaps. And they get free. The power of unity. But God's looking at it going, that's not a good thing because they're just staying here and I need them to spread out. But God had a bigger plan in mind. Turn me over to Acts chapter 2. So a few millennia go by. And now we have an incredible day that occurs. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Remember Tower? Made them speak in different languages? Here's the Spirit doing the similar thing with these guys. Now they were staying in Jerusalem. Now catch the wording here. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, Mesopotamia, uh, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. So here we got the day of Pentecost. We fast forward millennia. And God has now brought people from every nation into one spot. See, before, humans were trying to bring glory to themselves. Now God was going to bring glory to himself. By bringing people from every nation together. You know, one of the things I've always loved about the church is the diversity of culture. We learn so much about one another because of our relationships. During the 20th anniversary service weekend, we decided to have a picnic on the Saturday. 
because I thought, you know, people coming into town, I know what it's like on a Sunday, we're all here, and you haven't seen someone for a long time, and you literally get two minutes of conversation with them, and then they, someone else wants to talk to them. I thought, let's have a picnic. That way, you've got all kinds of time to hang out. The park that I picked was a place called Africville. Many of you may have no idea about Africville, but it is a contention of social injustice in my city. My son learned about Africville at Etobicoke Collegiate in Toronto. It's not even talked about in Halifax. We've got this park booked. The week before was the Africville reunion. RVs, it was packed. There's a buddy that I've been building a friendship with, I play basketball with, his name's Terry. I invited him to our picnic. So he comes down, and he's a native Nova Scotian, as we're talking, he pointed up to an area on the hill, he goes, that's where, uh, that's where my parents' house used to be, that's where I grew up. Nothing there now. I'm like, wow. His daughter runs the museum of Africville. So we gave a donation, and we had all the people who wanted to go to, through the museum go. Her name's Jada. So we're just talking, and she's filling me in on stuff that's not on the walls, stuff that's not necessarily written in history books, and I'm like, wow. Later on, she comes out, her and her friend, and she comes over to where we are at the park. And I kid you not, she was standing like this, and her eyes were like that of a deer in a headlight. And she was looking at the church. And we're all hugging one another, laughing, playing around, and this is what she said, how do you get them to do this? Jesus does. Because Jesus said, I came to break down dividing walls of hostility. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are Christians. Amen. And that love for one another is what has to be that, what makes a difference in our communities. Amen. It's the thing that makes a difference. God had brought them all together at such a time as this, from every nation, to fulfill a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 2, that his message was going to begin in Jerusalem. And this message was going to go out from there to all nations. A unified message. A message of forgiveness. A message of redemption. And a message of salvation. A fulfillment of God's plan in Genesis 1 to multiply and subdue the earth. As Christians, we are called to multiply and subdue the earth with this message. That's what we're called to do. History of the early church. You read through the book of Acts, you see some great, great victories. Think about it, 3,000. Can you imagine if today was that day for us? 3,000 people. We're going down, we're cutting a hole in the ice, in the, ca the canal, and we're going to baptize 3,000 people today. Would that not be a great victory? Feel free to shout, bro. Come on. Like I said, we got to laugh more. 5,000 more were baptized shortly thereafter. It began. But you know what? With great success comes what? Persecution. Opposition. And then shortly thereafter, you got all kinds of stuff going on. Because you got brothers and sisters who are now presenting a false image of who they are not being honest, Ananias and Sapphira, right? Hey, we sold, yeah, this is all the money, yeah, let's keep a little back, don't tell anybody. But they couldn't fool God. Can you imagine if today God did the same thing? The Bible says Jesus walks among us right now as we're in service together. And can you imagine him looking in your heart going, you're not really being honest. You know what, I need to bring great fear over the church and struck you dead on the spot. I shared this statement with a number of people. I don't want you to put up your hand. I just want you to think. Do you believe in God? Most people who are part of this church are going to tell me they do. Then here's my bigger question, and here's the test. Do you believe God? Well, I believe in God. Then do you believe Him? Do you believe the things that are written in here? For example, if someone has wronged you, Jesus said we are to forgive. And if you're unwilling to forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. 
Wow. Well, I don't think that... You can justify and spin all you want. Jesus said it. I did a lesson a couple weeks ago on grace and truth. There's a lot of people talking about grace, 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 grace. Jesus came and brought grace and truth. And I shared with my church, I said, you know what? We got to fight for the balance. And some of us lean towards the truth, and others want to lean towards grace at different stages. I said, me, I lean towards truth. I got to remember that so that I can bring grace along. So I can sit down with anybody and show you the scriptures and here's the truth, but am I bringing grace with them? I shared an example. There's a prostitute, two-year-old kid. Couldn't afford the rent, couldn't put food on the table. Went to the local shelter for help. While, they were, while she was getting help, they said, why don't you go to your local church? I'm sure they could help you. Her response was, why would I want to go there? They're going to make me feel more guilty than I already feel. Here was the point. Those were the people that were flocking to Jesus to help their brokenness, help them become whole. We, the church, who are supposed to reflect Jesus, are repelling them. We've got a problem. We've got to start extending more grace to people. I believe it starts in the church. You, it amazes me, and I talk to my church about this all the time, how come we can be so merciful and so graceful to non-Christian people we don't even know, and yet we'll hold grudges against our brother and sister who have given up their life to follow Jesus? Wow. Now you might go, you've got an agenda with your message. I always have an agenda. Because our goal is to walk as closely as we can with our Lord. So that we can be a great example to lead others to Christ. Because our mandate and our call is to spread the gospel. You think about the early church. You had people who were Christians who were trying to bring in legalism and hey, we got to follow the law and you got to circumcise those guys if they're going to become Christians. Now you got all that going on. Think about the church in 1 Corinthians and what kind of mess they were in. Paul starts off in 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9 and he's building them up. How awesome they are. Hold on. Don't you talk later about some guy sleeping with his father's wife and you got people getting lawsuits against one another in the church. Can't you find a handful of righteous men in your church to rectify that? That's the early church. So when we go through challenges, we're just like the first century church. We like to say, hey, we want to be like the first century church, all the good stuff. Well, guess what? We all got bumps and warts but we should be wrapping our arms around one another to help each other move forward. Amen. That's what we need. The power of unity, driven by the Holy Spirit. Turn me over to John 17. You know, it's amazing, uh, this is a little side note, this, is, this to me is amazing what God does. For Reed and I, two of our dearest friends, Mike and Domaly, we miss them immensely in Halifax. And all of a sudden, I show up here and I get a call this morning that they're in town and he's coming to church. And I'm like, like I feel like I'm a kid in a candy store. I just, and I, we have a great friendship and I'm joking about his hair because I've never seen it so long. And then his daughter walked in and I realized why his, he's letting it grow because she's almost as tall as him, so he's got to try to do something. <laughs> just saying but to me, the kingdom's about relationships. I've gone fishing twice in my life as a Christian. One time with Kevin Robbins, up to Manitoulin, where I have become the butt of many jokes because I'm the city boy who can't catch fish. And the other time was in the wintertime with Rob Groves took me down to Lake Ontario to go catch salmon in bitterly cold weather. <laughs> relationships, friendships. Stuff that goes beyond a moment, but a lifetime. Jesus here in John 17, verse 20, says, My prayer is not for them alone. 
I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as I, as you have loved me. I want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus prayed to the Father that we would be completely unified for one specific purpose. So that a lost world would believe that God sent Jesus here. Wow. I think back to Jada standing there looking at the church and wondering how you can get all these races loving one another. I don't have the answer. I didn't figure it out. I just submitted to God and whatever is in my heart, whatever is not godly, I need to repent of and change. Period. And I believe I'm a better human being and a better person because of the people that I've met in the kingdom from all over the world. I have had, now this may sound, sound odd to some in this room. I've had conversations with people. One situation in particular, where I was talking with this person, I said, when I see you, I don't see you as black. I see you as who you are. And I'll just use the name Daryl. Daryl looked at me and goes, you don't see me as black. And I said, no, I see you as Daryl. And he was so on this kick, and I said, being older, being a little bit more knowledgeable about things, I said, let me quote something to you. I have a dream that one day my children will be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. I'm judging you by the content of who you are, not the color of your skin. He didn't know how to respond. Because as Christians, we don't see things the way the world sees them. People are people, and they all have gifts from God, and we can all learn from it. And I think that makes my life richer. And I believe it makes your life richer. And when the world sees that kind of unity, it stands out to them. Because it's not out there. Jesus prayed that we would be completely unified. Kind of sounds like John 13. You want to be my disciple? I got a new command for you. Love one another. Oh, that's not a new command. No, no, no. Love one another as I have loved you. And by this, all people will know that you're my disciple. Well, how did Jesus just demonstrate his love? He took off his outer garment, wrapped it around him, got a bucket of water and started washing his disciples' feet. Their master lowered himself to wash their feet. And then if you really follow through that, I find it very fascinating. Then Jesus says, what I've done you don't understand, but later you will. Now go and do the same for one another. He doesn't say, now that I've served you, you got to serve me. That's the world. Now that I've set you an example, you go do likewise. A new command I give you. Love one another. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus was praying for our unity that it would stand out and people would see it. In conclusion... Turn me over to Psalms 18. And again, my hopes today in today's lesson is to get us to look to God because if we get our eyes on God, everything gets resolved. God will work things out. You know, it's like when Jesus ascended, right? And the disciples were like, wow, look at that. And all of a sudden, two guys dressed in white Hey, uh, what are you looking at? You need to start looking out, not up. Well, why? We already know Jesus has gone. Now we've got to look here. And how do we take that message to one another? You know, I know 
the Ottawa church has gone through some challenging time in the past few years. And I'm going to share something that people will say, but I don't know if in their heart they really believe. Satan is having a field day with those troubles. And as we look at the problems rather than to the solution of God, he continues to have a field day. We have a lack of harmony. We have a lack of unity. We have gossip and slander, malicious talk. And guess what? Yours is not the only church that goes through that stuff. <laughs> Same problem in Halifax. Same problem going on in Toronto. Same problem going on in Hamilton. It's human nature. The question is, how do we deal with it? And we've got to look to God. Proverbs 18 and verse 17. And I'm going to share with you the Holman Bible verse here. So Proverbs 18, verse 17. The first to state their case seems right until another comes forward and cross-examines them. In other words, one side of a story always seems right until someone else comes forward to ask some questions. Doesn't it always happen? As a minister, I hear things all the time, and I can even emotionally you start going, oh. And then I go ask the other person, go, hey, uh, I heard this. And then you hear the other side of the story, and you go, oh, hold on here a second. Something's not matching up here. One side of a story always seems right till someone comes forward to cross-examine the situation. And my experience in all my years has been this. When I get confronted with sin in my life, I have one of two options. I can either be humble and accept that and apologize and, and repent, or I can put a wall up and start fighting. Which is it that God wants? I've been a disciple 31 years as of February 15th. I have been in the ministry 30 and a half years. Might even be longer than that because I just remember from the time I came out of the water, I was leading two or three Bible talks. I was discipling four, five, six people. I was in a meeting on a Wednesday night, on a Friday night. I had church on Sunday. I had a date on Saturday. I had a leaders meeting on Sunday afternoon. Being in the ministry is not being paid. Being in the ministry is helping people become Christians. A lot of ministers in this room. But we buy into this world concept, well, if you're paid, you're a minister. No, you're not. Some of you might be shocked to find out how much money I made when I was in the full-time ministry to start. About $16,000 a year before taxes. Think about that. Take off Uncle Trudeau's portion. I was bringing home maybe $1,000 a month. Working 60 hours a week. I'm in the ministry not to get paid. I'm in the ministry because I believe people need to be saved. And I believe that before I ever got a paycheck. And so I'm challenging us as a church to get our eyes focused on Jesus and get about the business God has called you to. You know, this Tuesday evening, uh, sorry because I have to leave on Wednesday morning, but we're, we're asking that we have a midweek on Tuesday night. A time for the church to get together and to ask questions and to shed some light on the situation that has been ongoing here for the last couple years. That's why I'm here. Because we got to get beyond this and get moving. And I have no agenda in the sense of, well, I'm on this person's side or that person's side. I'm on God's side. And people have a hard time with that. I've been involved in some other situations. I've literally had evangelists say, you got to pick a side. And I've looked at them and said, I have. I picked God's. You're in sin and they're in sin and you both need to repent. Guys, God is who we follow. Turn me over to Psalms 139. I did a, a, a midweek series in Halifax, and we were talking about, you know, harmony and relationships and all that kind of stuff. See, it's not just here. It's everywhere. Because, see, we have an adversary called Satan who goes after our Achilles heels. And so we've got to be wise enough, as the Bible says, not being outwitted by Satan's schemes. 
Psalms 139, right at the end in verse 23, 24, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Is, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. One of the first things I do when I deal with conflict is I ask people, I want you to go pray this prayer for the next few days, the next week, the next two weeks, and ask God to reveal in your heart what you're doing to add to the problem. Well, I haven't done anything. Everybody has a little bit to play. Let God reveal in your heart. Because when we come to self-realization, self-awareness of, man, you know, maybe the way I have been talking to that brother, the way I said this to that sister, maybe that is partly why they're responding the way. I need to change that. Oh, well, they should just, that's our problem. We always put it on everyone else rather than, you don't know what their life's been like. You don't know if the tone you're using is the way their dad talked in their entire life and they just got triggers. We don't know. So we go and pray, God, please reveal whatever offensive way there might be in me. Yeah, but what if they don't apologize? Well, you know what? That's between them and God. You need to forgive where you need to forgive and you need to apologize where, because that's between you and God. Well, they haven't admitted that they did anything. Yeah? Okay. So we put people in dog houses until they do? Like... And to what level do we accept their, their change? Imagine if God treated us that way. Well, you know, you were flipping around on the internet the other day and you were looking at some stuff you shouldn't have and, yeah, God, I'm so sorry. And Well, I, don't, I just don't know if that's good enough. Uh, I hope you don't die in the next few days, next week, because I, I don't know if I'm going to accept you. Wow. God doesn't treat us that way. God has so much grace and love for us. We've got to learn to extend that. And let me share one last passage with you. And may this, this terminology stick with you for a long time. Matthew 28. A passage we all know very well. We use it in our discipleship study. But I'm going to give you the MU version. Marty Udall version. Right at the end in verse 19. It says, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I've got your back till I meet you in heaven. Think about that for a minute. Jesus has got our back. That helps me feel more confident. Jesus has my back. I'm going to make mistakes. I might have said some things up here that might have upset you. I may have said some things that are wrong. Sorry for that, and I apologize, and that wasn't my intent. But I know Jesus got my back. And he's going to help me grow and change. And I'd like to think the guy standing before you after 31 years is a lot different than the one who stood here when he got out of the water. But we have, we have so much more to do God wants to do so much in this city. The only question there is to answer is, is he going to use us? Or like the Hebrews in the desert, he's going to have to wait for the next generation. God's going to get the job done. Question is, with who? At this time, my dear friend, Michael Obroqua, is going to come forward and lead us in prayer as we prepare to take our communion.